Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, those of you that are joining us from around the world. Thanks so much for taking the time to take part in this ISMA uh, annual general meeting report and uh, presentation from our guest speaker today. Uh, I'm Jeff French, I'm the president of the International Social Marketing Association. And again, once, once again, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, the, the schedule for this hour is that I'll give a, a brief uh, introduction to what ISMA has been doing along with its uh, affiliated associations over the last year. So a little look back and then a look forward to some of the things that we'll be tackling in 22-23. Um, and then we're going to have a presentation uh, from uh, Jackie Namara Raka Kari. Uh, sorry for murdering that, Jackie, um, uh, about social marketing in Africa and the new uh, African Social Marketing Association, a little bit about that for about 25 minutes or so. And then after Jackie's presentation, uh, we can have a conversation, Q&A uh, for about another 15 or 20 minutes. And then we'll wrap up. We will close bang, bang on the hour. So uh, what I'll do is I'm just gonna share my screen now and talk you through only for about five or 10 minutes, uh, some of the things that ISMA has been doing over the last year and what we plan to do uh, going forward. Hopefully you can all see the, the, the screen. Um, yeah, it, well, it's been my pleasure over the last year to be president of the association and to work alongside members of the board. Big shout out to all of those people that sit on the board and the volunteering work that they do. Nobody gets paid to work at ISMA. We're all volunteers uh, committed to promoting social marketing around the world. So huge thanks to all the people on the board and particularly to each of the working groups and committees that have taken the work of the association forward. Also big thanks to all the volunteers that support those board members, again, from around the world. Uh, huge thank you to all of you. Um, there are uh, three big uh, uh, aspects to ISMA's mission, you know, what we're trying to do, why we exist. First and foremost is to advance social marketing practice, research and teaching, and build collaborative networks of professionals, supporters and enthusiasts around the world. So we want people to link with ISMA, but also to link between associations to capture and spread good practice. Second big uh, driver for us is developing and documenting and marketing international standards of good practice in social marketing uh, in terms of implementation, but also theory, research and practice. Uh, there's a huge amount of fantastic work going on out there in the world, but sometimes we're not as good as we could be at capturing that information, spreading it and getting it built in to operating systems for organizations, governments, NGOs, and uh, other organizations. And our third driver, what we're trying to achieve is to foster and support the development of local, national, regional uh, associations around the world, of which there are a growing number. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in, in subsequent slides. Uh, progress over the last year, uh, uh, we've got a growing range of uh, training and development services offered directly by ISMA. Uh, we have uh, Nancy Lee's uh, uh, online uh, taught uh, course, an introduction to social marketing. We have the basics of social marketing principles, a self-study online learning tool, which is available in both English and Spanish, and will by the end of this year be available in five other languages. Um, we've developed uh, a new course on research and evaluation, which also has been launched uh, this month. We've been working on developing best practice uh, guidance, uh, and we've set up a new standards group to uh, capture uh, what constitutes good practice in social marketing and uh, try and codify that. And then we'll be spreading that, that uh, uh, learning and guidance uh, through our associations. Uh, we have uh, seen this year, I think, some really good progress on our online 
and web-based services, including our, our webinar offerings, but also our social media presence, which has gone up a lot over the last year. And it's something we're going to be doing more on in, in the coming year. Uh, we've increased volunteering opportunities, thanks to Nancy Lee and uh, uh, many of the volunteers that have worked through her orbit committees. Uh, we've got a large bank of volunteers working on our, all of our projects, but we're always looking for more. So if you're interested in volunteering to work with us, uh, please do contact us and we'll match you up with uh, our committees who are needing uh, extra assistance. Um, we've also this year put in place, over the last year, put in place some standardised agreements with our affiliated associations. Uh, so that puts our relationship with them on, on a clearer uh, and sounder footing. So that's really helpful and will be useful going forward. And uh, we've been putting a lot of work into supporting the growth of social marketing communities, uh, groups and associations around the world. So let's, let's go back. This map shows you that, uh, you know, a large part of the world now uh, have associations. Great to see uh, the new African Association launched this year. There are discussions uh, continuing about the development of an Asian association, uh, potentially Australasia as well, Oceania. Uh, there are new local country associations in uh, Japan, uh, France, Portugal, Spain, uh, and Italy, and others are being, being developed. So really great to see that growth and the interconnectedness uh, between these associations is something that we want to push for in the coming year. But also, I just wanted to share with you this uh, graph, which kind of uh, uh, sets out the uh, annual evolution of the number of publications and citations around social marketing. And what you can see is a big growth in this hill, which is, which is actually you know, fantastic to see. And it's an indication of how social marketing is being adopted I think by many more uh, organizations uh, and governments and NGOs around the world. Great to see. Challenges ahead as we see them are mentioned already the development and application of good practice standards, uh, which will be uh, start to be available at the end of this year. We're also, we also have a working group uh, developing a set of ethical standards and guidance documents. Uh, and you know, practical guidance about tackling ethical challenges. Again, they'll be launched for consultation uh, towards the end of this year, probably at the World Conference in September. Um, we also want to uh, see, and it's, and it's an ongoing challenge, uh, to promote uh, social marketing as an integral contributor to the understanding of social problems and uh, a great way of developing uh, interventions that you know, challenge some of those uh, big problems that we all face in health, environment, uh, and uh, the economic field as well. So we want to kind of mainstream social marketing and reach out to organisations that uh, are promoting that, like like UNICEF. Um, uh, we're going to put more effort into supporting uh, the growing and diverse range of social marketing organisations and partnerships. And also this year, reach out to people who work not in social marketing, but in related fields like health communication and behavioral change, behavioral economics. So a reach out and a further networking with these organizations to build a big tent of collaboration is one of our, our aims. And uh, finally, we, we want to be assisting with the development of the evidence base for social marketing. Uh, we started a piece of work to develop a global uh, portal uh, or web service capturing case study and research and evaluation studies in social marketing, uh, which again, we hope to be launching by the end of this year. We will need uh, all of our, our social marketing colleagues around the world to populate that database slash portal, but it will become, we think, a, a really useful resource uh, for those people working in the field, not only to capture uh, uh, what they're doing, uh, but also to spread knowledge about what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, so yeah, this is just a summary of our uh, uh, kind of uh, forward uh, uh, objectives. For those of you that are interested, um, this is a, a financial breakdown. As I've said, ISMA is not a profit organization. Uh, it's a voluntary organization. It's a registered not-for-profit in the United States. Uh, and 
uh, therefore any income that's generated through membership fees and other sources of income is ploughed back into uh, uh, the work of the association. Uh, for those of you that are interested, a full copy of uh, uh, the annual report will be available on our, our website, along with uh, our financials, uh, uh, if you're interested. If you have any questions about anything that I've mentioned or any comments, uh, please, you know, in the Q&A session of, uh, of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, please uh, set those out, or you can contact me afterwards through ISMA website and uh, happy to respond to any questions or comments that you have. Okay, uh, at this point, we, we won't take questions. We'll, we'll uh, save those uh, to, to the end. Uh, what uh, I will do, just let me show. And I can stop sharing. Stop sharing. Uh, it's now uh, my great pleasure. I guess the reason that most of you uh, tuned into this uh, session is to hear uh, from Jackie. Uh, so, so Jackie uh, Namara Raku Kari is uh, an experienced uh, uh, marketer, uh, communications consultant, and she has extensive experience in marketing and public relations and management uh, with a career spanning 19 years. Uh, across a wide range of projects and programs. Jackie is also the co-founder of Sugar Cubes, a support group for children and families dealing with childhood uh, diabetes. Uh, she's also a, a, a chartered marketeer with the Chartered Institute of Marketing and a fellow of that organization as well. Jackie's got a proven track record in establishing and growing marketing and communication teams and departments motivating and leading teams and collaborations with all levels of operational staff and management to execute strategic vision uh, through meaningful business plans. Uh, Jackie's also uh, got a lot of board, exper board level experience uh, in social marketing and social entrepreneurship. She sits on the boards of the Uganda Health Marketing Group and Capital Solutions Limited. Jackie says she's fascinated about how brands uh, influence our lives and how we can use these as tools to support sustainable business and how marketing and communications can be applied as a means of supporting communities for lasting behavioral change, especially in regard to diabetes in children and as tools for health advocacy. So we're really lucky to have uh, Jackie uh, with us today. As I say, she's going to speak about uh, social marketing in Africa and a little bit about the new uh, African Social Marketing Association. If you're interested in joining that association or collaborating with it, uh, we will publish uh, details about how you can contact them. And I think Jackie has a, a link slide in her presentation. So Jackie, thanks so much for being with us uh, and I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, I don't know whether it's afternoon, evening, night, morning, wherever you are, but you're most welcome to the session today. And I will be representing the Africa Social Marketing Association in just sharing a few stories about where we've gone, uh, where we've been and how we are progressing on the African continent in regards to social marketing. So we'll start with a little bit of history of social marketing on the continent. Uh, the first campaigns are believed to have been family planning campaigns run by the founders of PSI, Phil Harvey and Dr. Tim Black in Kenya. Um, and we've come a long ways uh, since then. And through the decades, what we've seen is a progression where the elements around social and behavior change communication have started to become incorporated in a much wider um, range of areas uh, to today where we see them being incorporated in, in fields like environment, um, <clears throat> crime, corruption, where the typical thing has always been that we are uh, focusing these efforts on health. It's still the majority of where we see social, uh, social marketing efforts on the continent. It's still dominated by health, especially public health messages. But it's nice to see that, that um, the learnings and the lessons taken from those experiences are now being applied to other sectors and other social challenges. The Africa Social Marketing Association um, is basically a platform that brings together all the interested stakeholders and parties who are committed to using social marketing as a powerful tool for addressing social challenges. 
Uh, and because the focus here is on behavior change, what we're looking for is behavior change for social good. We currently have about seven countries represented, and this will be expanded to all countries on the continent, and, and we look forward to having that in place. The platform is um, intended to be an all-encompassing one, and we've tried to look not just at the people who are in the industry of social marketing, but to look a little bit wider and involve, uh, for example, academia, government, policymakers, private sector, to make sure that we have a holistic view about how we can take social marketing to the next level on the continent. Our objectives are very similar to the objectives of the International Social Marketing Association. And really what we want to see is a space where we can see social marketing thrive on the continent by bringing together the practitioners and everybody else that is involved in the development and execution of social marketing programs but also a place where we can find resources, where we can find information uh, and where we can start to influence the conversations around how social marketing can be seen as an agent for social change on the continent. How are we doing this at the moment? We are running a series of webinars, seminars. Uh, there is a conference that we'll be talking about at the end of the presentation, uh, providing um, each other with the resources around social marketing, obviously networking, and I think more importantly, also creating a central database where we can come and access information about what has worked and not worked in regards to social marketing in Africa. So to that end, I would like to share with you a few examples of some of the work that has happened over the years um, and some of the results that have been achieved from these various uh, campaigns. We start with Mozambique, and this particular um, uh, program was addressing the issue of childhood malnutrition. And, uh, and to do this, the vehicle that was selected was a micronutrient powder that was added to food. And uh, what was interesting about this campaign was that there was also going to be a need to talk to the food habits, especially in terms of preparation and serving. So while people knew there was an issue, uh, there wasn't an easy and convenient, affordable way to do this. So rather than telling people to go and look for uh, food types that they couldn't possibly afford on a regular basis, the addition of this powder to already what was available was seen to be the most effective way to get the nutrition rates up. Um, it was a combination of things used. There was a campaign with a lovable character. Um, and this was focused on uh, creating the, the ethos uh, around, centered around the ethos of a strong baby or a strong child and supported with a holistic marketing campaign, but also a voucher program to allow people to redeem um, the various uh, product sachets at different distribution points. Uh, it was a multi-stakeholder co collaboration involving the Ministry of Health in, in Mozambique. And um, what is also particularly interesting about this is that while the product started out as a nutritional food supplement. Um, in the course of the execution of this campaign, with research and with the understanding of how to take this to the next level, it was redefined as a vitamin supplement and expanded in terms of the age range from not just kids, but to go all the way into adulthood. Uh, and in the period when the campaign and the program was running over 100 uh, so over, over 1 million units were sold. Um, and this was heavily supported with announcements from uh, respected healthcare professionals. The other example from Southern Africa comes to us from South Africa. Uh, and this is quite a famous one um, targeted at men and helping them to develop healthy behavior around HIV prevention, um, circumcision and sexual and gender-based violence. It's a fairly long one in terms of it run for almost 10 years. And it's a particularly good one because you can see the commitment to a long-term intervention as opposed to just coming in for one specific um, issue at that particular time. It also spoke to the differences and the nuances in a post-apartheid uh, South Africa, where we see campaigns that basically reflect all the ethnicities that are present in the country. Um, there was quite a bit of um, use of local sports and uh, 
entertainment celebrities as well as local community leaders to just reinforce um, these messages. What we see in terms of the results from this campaign was basically an increased uh, response in terms of people who are seeking help uh, from the National uh, Gender-Based Violence Helpline, uh, people who are reporting that they would stop, um, especially the violent behavior, uh, an encouragement to use, uh, do more HIV um, testing and you know, take on those behaviors that are seen to reduce infection rates. Um, I'm going to play uh, three ads that showcase different aspects um, of this campaign, just to give you an idea of what was involved. I used to beat up my wife. I beat her up for my own infidelities. I beat her up for my own insecurities. I would say, I want to beat you so hard that you scream, you cry louder than my mom. I wanted her to love me. But how can you say that someone loves you when they are afraid of you? That's when I realized that I needed to change. Enough was enough. It was not about what anybody else said. It was about me. And with me, it had to stop. You didn't choose to be brought up in an abusive home. No one says no. You didn't choose to grow up around men who harassed women. You didn't choose to be molested. None of those things were your choice. But raping her will be. You can't change your past, but you can choose the man you become. Sorry. Call us for free on this number if you need help. Brothers for Life. Yenzagal. <laughs> All smiles today. Oh, you again. Mm. Thomas, my man, got an upgrade. Down there. At first, he wouldn't go. But, Angela, circumcision is good for both of us, Tandra. Less chance of us getting STIs, HIV, and Mina. Cervical cancer. Ben. 30 minutes for the upgrade. Six weeks to heal, and then. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much better. <laughs> Yo, but you meant to. Okay, we now cross over to East Africa to Rwanda. Um, with a program dubbed in Shakidwa. Uh, and this was around trying to reduce the intimate partner violence that has uh, been you know, reported as a key challenge in the area. It was a two pronged approach, one which was a bit more private with what they were calling a couple's curriculum where they went through the issues that were known to spark uh, off violence. And this was coupled with community based activism, uh, basically to see whether that uh, peer, if you like, pressure from the community would also influence uh, the behavior chain that was needed. Uh, this program also created safe spaces where women who were survivors could go and get the support that they needed, as well as training of the opinion leaders in those environments. Uh, for this particular campaign, uh, what was clear was that definitely the rates um, of uh, intimate partner violence dropped. Uh, for both men and women. But what was interesting was that the community activism did not um, have the desired effect. In other words, that didn't seem to influence people's behavior um, to, to reduce the levels of violence. And, and this was 
further interrogated and revealed that in, in terms of the cultural um, norms around talking about sex and, and how it relates to violence, people preferred to have the private conversations and they were not really willing to act uh, when those conversations were held in, in, in public. So those are the lessons that uh, came through that particular program. On to Sudan, and, and this one was around climate change and the impact that it has on women, especially around food security and management of water resources. Uh, and for the Sudan, the focus was on the aspects of food security and uh, water. And what this particular program uh, unearthed was that women were key in ensuring food security for households and that through a simple thing like a vegetable garden uh, called a jubraka, they were able to ensure that they had food throughout um, the season, especially in the dry seasons. And any surpluses that co were coming out of these gardens were then sold, also then impacting um, the income levels uh, for those particular live uh, households. Um, in Sudan, what was seen to be one of the uh, critical supporting factors for this particular program was that there were a number of women involved at state level in the technical committees, technical committees that were supporting this particular program to ensure that women indeed benefited from this. And, and this is something that um, is important when you have women at the decision-making um, level, especially for policy. Uh, the funny one, or maybe the unintended result was that um, once the uh, cooking gas was introduced as an alternative um, to the traditional firewood, some of the men in the community were not very happy because they thought that the women were now becoming lazy uh, because the amount of time that was being spent on things like um, fetching water and uh, preparing meals dropped dramatically from 32% to 6%. Uh, so some unhappy campers as, <laughs> Of, of this particular uh, campaign, but that then meant that the women were able to spend that time saved on more productive activities within uh, their communities. My personal favorite um, is from Tanzania, and this is around making education fun and accessible for all kids across the countries where uh, this particular channel uh, is available. And this is really about taking educational content and making it fun and easy for children to relate to by putting it in a cartoon format. Uh, so there are two um, products, Akili and Me and Ubongo Kids to cater for different age groups. And this particular program has been run with multiple partners who work together to ensure that the content that is being put out with the broadcast partners is well-researched, evidence-based, um, and is then therefore guided in terms of which production formats will be the best suited to allow, uh, enable the kids uh, to learn. So we'll just see a short segment for Ubongo Kids to show you the kind of content and how it has, the cartoon format is used to bring these messages to life. Um, so far, the content is available um, in 18 countries, um, mostly under free broadcast, so it is heavily supported and sponsored. Uh, but what is really um, important is what this has done in terms of numeracy and literacy levels and helping kids to develop their you know, social and emotional skills. And in COVID, it was seen as a particularly useful tool for encouraging children to adopt hand washing, sanitizing, and social distancing habits uh, to keep safe during this particular period. Akili. Bongo is a Swahili word and the meaning of it is brain. You use it to find solutions to whatever life throws your way. If you're in a tough situation, don't give a don't you complain. It's okay, you find a way, just use your brain. Okay. 
And uh, our last example is from Uganda. Uh, and this had to do with addressing the fact that the HIV infection rates among married couples was rising. Um, it also tackled the, uh, I would say the inertia or the fact that people were exhausted with the traditional ABC approach um, to getting behavior change around uh, reduction of HIV infection rates. So for several decades, the message had been abstain, um, be faithful and wear a condom. And at, at that point, people were really just you know, tired of, of hearing that message. So the Get Off the Sexual Network campaign was one that was aimed at rejuvenating the conversation around HIV, especially amongst this, uh, the, the, the married couples, because that's where infection rates were going. And the insight around that was that people were not paying attention to who else they were sleeping with in terms of their sexual partners. Uh, so this particular campaign was very successful in Uganda, actually entered um, the local lingua and has always been referred to as one of the most successful uh, campaigns. We did see a reduction in, in, in uh, people who were committing to now uh, stick to one partner and uh, also testifying that they had, you know, either knew somebody who had gotten off the sexual network and just the awareness around the impact of and implications of having multiple sexual partners whose sexual history you were not privy to. Um, so I'll play one more video um, which talks to what the impact was of that particular campaign for the target audience. Meet. Yeah, based on that campaign, I've really changed my, my lifestyle and uh, I'm like, you know, I'm stick to my wife and be sure that I know what I'm doing. And if I'm making friends, I know the kind of friends I'm having. And even then, when I'm in a car and maybe I have an appointment with a lady, you know, just to meet for a casual friendship, and you hear of that uh, advert, that campaign, you're like, really, where am I going? The sexual network does not stop with you. HIV spreads faster when you're involved with more than one partner. Don't put your life and that of your family at risk. Commit to your partner. One love. Get off the sexual network and live a good life. Okay. So what are some of the challenges we face on the continent? Um, resources are always scarce, um, so little money, so little time, and so many issues to deal with, but that's, I guess, a universal uh, problem. But also the fact that the, there isn't really a central place where we can go and access information, uh, and that's something that the African Social Marketing Association is very keen to put together to facilitate this process for practitioners on the continent. We are also a continent that has diverse challenges, and while social marketing efforts have predominantly been in the health space, uh, we would like to see this approach apply to other um, social challenges that would benefit from the way uh, social marketing is, is done. Like everything else, we need information, we need insights. And um, the fact that there's sometimes a reluctance to commit money and funding to do evaluation and look at <coughs> excuse me, the outcomes of some of these campaigns means that uh, you might be operating on anecdotal um, information, uh, and yet we do need this data and, and insights to determine what we do next. Um, for disinformation, this is about the fact that we have um, access to you know, information at our fingertips 24-7, and with this comes obviously the issues of having information that's incorrect, no um, information that's been distorted, uh, and that definitely impacts some of the work that we do. We, we did see this a lot around uh, COVID vaccine, and of course everybody was scared, but not having the right information might make people make the wrong choices uh, to stay healthy. Then of course we have uh, outcomes versus outputs, for a long time, we have reported on the activities that take place, especially around the comms, uh, communications aspect. But we also want to see 
what this work has done in terms of reducing uh, maternal and child deaths in uh, getting more women to attend all the antenatal visits they need to attend in, in getting uh, youth to uh, go to a family planning uh, service space and get the support they need in um, protecting the environment. So the shift that we need to see to outcomes is important because then that tells the world that this actually works. In terms of successes, we have had programs, especially the ones which are running over a long period of time, uh, where we've had multi-sector approaches. So we do see a very good collaborations between government, development partners, and other funders, private sector, and the communities which are impacted coming together to actually work for this uh, lasting social change. And there's that constant reinforcement um, to make sure the behaviors stick. Uh, in Africa, we love a good story. And where we see these stories well told, we always see that there's impact when people understand clearly what has happened, what they need to do, and what they need to commit to doing in the future. Uh, we're also seeing some really interesting things in the use of new media. Um, Sunlam, for example, in South Africa, developed the first um, WhatsApp drama, wholly executed on WhatsApp. And, and they were trying to basically debunk the myths around uh, having a funeral policy because death is still quite a taboo topic in, in a lot of our cultures. But by putting together this execution, they demonstrated that it is possible for you to respect your culture but still be prepared uh, by having a, a funeral plan in place. And we do see some interesting things, especially for youth in the virtual and augmented reality, where they are placed in scenarios where they need to make decisions and, and see the consequences of their actions. We are also glad to see that the social marketing approach is being applied to other um, areas on the continent. We've seen work in the environment, in education, for responsible drinking, and I think this only serves to validate that social marketing is indeed a change for social good. So what's coming up next for the association? We would like to invite you to participate in our upcoming conference next April. Uh, it will be at the Wits University in South Africa and I will be sharing the LinkedIn link um, for you to join and get that information. So we hope to see you there. So Professor Debbie and Dr. Lucy are point people in, in case you want to get in touch with them directly. And at a later stage, we will be able to communicate about submitting abstracts or anything you'd like uh, to, if you want to be a speaker during that conference. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you've had a chance to get a little snippet of what social marketing looks like on the African continent and how the African Social Marketing Association is driving this agenda. Thank you. Okay, that's uh, great, Jackie. Thanks so much, really uh, interesting. And uh, you, people are kind of posting uh, their, their appreciation of, of the talk. Um, a couple of questions uh, just to start us off. Uh, others on, on the call, please post your questions in the Q&A and I'll, I'll read them out and ask Jackie to respond to them. Uh, first one in is uh, from, from Liz Foote. Uh, she was asking about the uh, IPV uh, campaign in Rwanda, and you mentioned about uh, social norms shifting. She was asking, she's asking about how did you measure that social norms change in that program, or how did the, the people that ran that program uh, measure the social norms shift? Um, according to the report that I, 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 I read, uh, there were two things that they were looking at the drops in the, the reported cases um, around um, IPV, uh, but also looking at the villages where they had implemented these programs and then the ones where they hadn't, they hadn't where they equally had um, high rates of, of IPV. And I think what they found was that the more direct one-on-one -on -one approach with the couples using the couples curriculum was far more powerful because the two people who were involved in the sexual um, or intimate violence scenarios were the ones who had to go and maybe unlearn some of the things they had learned were culturally and, and uh, acceptable and, and pick up some new patterns and try them out. 
Uh, and once they began to see those shifts between those who'd gone through the curriculum and those who hadn't, that was an indicator that there was something that was shifting around the social norms around violence, especially within um, a, a, a committed relationship. Uh, so I guess it's one of those things which has to be tracked in the long term to see whether that uh, behavior change sticks and whether there's actually now a more open conversation around uh, violence in those intimate uh, situations. But at least for the, the program, that's what uh, the research showed. Okay, that, that's that's really helpful, very clear. Uh, uh, Nedra has got a, a question in as well. Uh, th says, Thanks, Jackie, for the presentation. What, why do you think, uh, sorry, what do you think are the biggest barriers to the spread of social marketing in Africa? If there are, if there are barriers, if you perceive that there are. Oh, well, um, I think maybe one of the biggest ones is maybe we, there, there aren't enough people that understand what social marketing is and how it can be used to, um, you know, create some interventions or solutions for a wide range of, of, of problems that we face. Uh, so definitely the awareness. I think it's one of those things until I was sitting on the board of Uganda Health Marketing Group, I, I had been in conventional marketing for a very long time, but I knew very little about social marketing specifically. So there's definitely something about mainstreaming social marketing into um, you know, how we go about our business. Uh, but I think now the there is a certain open mindedness um, that has enabled these conversations to come to the fore, and also we are beginning to see they might not know it's called social marketing. It might be given other terms, but you begin to see elements of social marketing uh, cropping up in different spaces. Uh, but definitely, I think the awareness is the the biggest hurdle, and then. We, I think also as a community, we haven't been very good at going out to the general public to talk about the successes of, of social marketing and even the failures. So unless you're in the community and you're attending conferences and webinars and other networking events, the wider business community, or even in government or even with partners that we work with for these programs, uh, tend not to be aware of what's happening in, in our space. Uh, and so we need to be a bit more should I say, aggressive in, in communicating, um, you know, what we do, how we do it, what's working, what's not working, so that people can begin to appreciate the value of, of, uh, of social marketing. Um, one of the things I know uh, for me as, um, as a marketing professional that we have started to have conversations with is also to introduce some uh, training courses in our local universities uh, to basically make this available, just like you'd go and study for any other uh, course, there should be a course on social marketing. There aren't enough of them on the continent. Um, and I think once we start to do that, then people begin to understand that this is just, you know, just like everything else um, and, and it's accessible. Yeah, that, that's good. Uh, uh, the, the work that ISMA is doing, again, with its affiliated associations on developing standards, We'll also look at curricula, so if, you know ideal curricula. So that would be very happy to share with you, Jackie, and also to get your input uh, into that. Uh, I've got a good question here from uh, Marvin from the Netherlands. It says hi, I'm Marvin from the Netherlands, uh, and I had the pleasure to visit several countries in Africa on several occasions. Uh, can you please elaborate on how you get insight uh, into the intended target audiences you want to work with in your programs? One of the fascinating things I experienced in Africa was the big differences in cultures in countries and tribes. How do you get understanding of these audiences? Uh, good luck with your great work. So yeah, your, your views about how you gather uh, you know, insights from you know, diverse populations. Yeah, thank you, Marvin, for that. Um, so for me, I go back to my sociology roots. I think there is no easy way to do this. You, you have to spend time with the, the target audiences. Um, they, they needs to be maybe a mix of conventional research, but also a bit of anthropology you know, uh, type research where you actually go and spend time and live with the community and just observe what they're doing, how they're doing it, probe why they're doing what they do, because those are sort of questions which will not be answered in a questionnaire. 
But if I'm staying with you for a couple of days, there are things you won't be able to hide from me. <laughs> um, I, I know I've done this when I used to work with Unilever and we we're trying to figure out how um, households use certain food products. Um, we actually used to go and spend time in those families and, and observe how they were using it because people would say, you, would say one thing to you in the typical questionnaire format and then do something completely different. Um, so adding that observational piece, um, I think allows you to either validate what someone has mentioned before, but it also allows you to pick up on some of those nuances and differences, especially when you think about the variety of ethnicities um, and languages and influences on the African continent. It's, it, it would be foolhardy of us to think we could do a copy and paste. Um, the campaigns which are successful in one part of the continent may completely fail in another if we don't take that into consideration. So I think observing is, is one way to be sure that you are capturing those nuances that might not be picked up in the typical um, interviewing sort of process. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure yeah. Uh, another question just for, for, for me is, you know, one of the big challenges that many people face around the world uh, when developing programs aimed at influencing behavior is that the, the funding is often short term, one or two or three years if you're lucky. And also, you know, organizations kind of interests, uh, you know, wane. Uh, sometimes, they, you know, they're not sustained over time. So, you know, it, it have, is that been your experience in the, the places in Africa where you've worked, that sustainability of programs is, is an issue? Or, or has it been relatively easy to sustain these programs over a longer period of time? Yeah, I, that's, it's a perennial issue always. Um, and I think the, if, if we look at, the, there are certain, um, especially for health, there are certain areas where you know that you pretty much always get funding, whether it's government, private sector, um, development partners, uh, for, for fairly long periods of time. And then there are other, um, especially in the non-communicable diseases space, that's a bit more challenging to get commitment for long-term funding because um, it's, it's just one of those things where like, okay, the priorities we have uh, is, is malaria more important than diabetes. Uh, and so some hard choices have to be made, but I think maybe we need to take a, should I say a longer term view and 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 think of them as um, instead of thinking of it as I, I have this one thing to deal with as a as a product, say, for example, um, let me take a project view of it and say, if we are dealing with teenage pregnancies, it's highly unlikely in a three to five year program, we are not going to bring down the rates of teenage pregnancy. It's impossible. It's a multi-generational program. So we have to make a commitment to say this thing, minimum, we need to take maybe a 20 year view. We need to look at multiple generations and what are we building on and adding on to for the next generation. So even when you're having conversations with people for financing, you have to say, look, yes, would love the money that you can give us, but could you consider doing a 10 year span so that we have that conversation upfront because you know it's not a situation or a challenge that is going to be sorted out in the short term. And what are the sort of creative ways that we can also start to engage the communities to put something back uh, into the kitties. Now that we have um, access to a lot of digital payment platforms, you can even encourage the local population to put in a bit of their own um, money, however little it is, and it, it all adds up. Uh, then once that becomes the norm in terms of the way we approach those, those particular challenges we know are not going to be solved over a short project span, I think then we can also have a different conversation around the financing, even with governments to say, can you make a commitment to put in X amount of money in the budget for this particular issue? And, and that becomes something that you get commitment for upfront, as opposed to going back every financial year to ask for one little bit more. Uh, maybe that's one way to do it. I don't know. But I think taking a longer term view um, certainly helps and changes the conversation as opposed to just thinking of the shorter term interventions. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, we've got two more questions in. Just to say to everybody, we've got, we've got about you know eight or nine minutes left on this call. So if you have any other questions, do post them now. 
The next one's from Diogo, who's uh, based in the UK. Uh, uh, thanks for a great presentation. Currently, ISMA has focused its training programs online, but that can be a disadvantage uh, for countries where access to the internet is limited, which is the case in several African countries. Do you have any thoughts on how training could be promoted in those contexts? Um, okay, I can speak to Uganda and maybe Kenya because I know this is a conversation we've had with telco operators. So what happened when COVID hit, uh, a lot of the telco operators zero rated educational content and they're quite happy to keep doing that as long as you, you approach them and you have a formal um, agreement. So the issue now is really not so much the cost of the internet, but whether it's reliable internet. Uh, and that's a conversation which is kind of beyond our control, but we can have, we can influence, uh, we can persuade uh, the service providers to, to make sure they're doing something to make sure that there's a reliable internet connection wherever people are, uh, but they've pretty much zero rated educational content. If you ask for it, most times the answer is yes. Uh, so that's at least one thing that that we can um, we can bank on for, for Uganda and Kenya because I know that's already happening now. Uh, the other countries on the continent, I, they might be a subsidy for certain education portals uh, that are available online, but most are, uh, are happy to give you a free or a portion of free or a subsidy to allow access to that uh, content. Okay, that, that's really useful, and that's something it'd be good to discuss with you after the call. Uh, in terms of some of ISMA's online uh, offerings as well. Uh, we have a, a question in from uh, uh, Alina, who's from Moldova. Um, what about the term social marketing? Are the specialists open to use this term? In our country, marketing is not always accepted in the social sector, and the social communication is a more preferred term, even if, even if it's not always relevant. So. The language is the like basically is the language uh, of social marketing a, a, a problem uh, in terms of your experience? Uh, it could be, but I think you you roll with the punches. If social communication is more acceptable in your environment and gets you in the rooms and into the spaces where you need to be to get the work done, so be it. Uh, I think if we get hung up on the titles, then we're missing an opportunity to, to do the work. Uh, so for me, it's like, what, what will allow us to do the work? If you want to call me a social communicator, no problem. <laughs> I have no issues with that. Um, if that is what is given prominence and is valuable in your environment. If, if it's social marketing, fantastic. As long as we have a common understanding as practitioners that this is what we're about and what we want to do, I think this, the titles are secondary. Uh, they might be a bit of confusion, but then again, it falls to us to make the, the clarifications. Um, you know, this might be the title, but if we are clear about what we actually do and how we deliver it, uh, then maybe the title is not such a big deal. But that's that's just me. I, I might be completely wrong for Moldova. <laughs> well, I, I totally agree with you. It's it's not that it's not the language; it's the principles of best practice that that, that, that are important. Okay, that, that that's really fantastic. Thanks so much, Jackie. A great presentation and great Q and A session. We really appreciate that. Uh, I'm I'm going to wrap up the session now. We just want to say again, big thanks to to Jackie, uh, also to Christine, who's behind the scenes uh, as our kind of web host. Done a, a great job in terms of the technical side of these things. Thanks so much to all of you for taking this uh, hour out of your day uh, to be with us, to pose the questions, and to listen to Jackie's presentation. Uh, from the ISMA perspective, huge thanks to all our uh, affiliated associations. We look forward to working with you uh, as we go forward into the next year. And personally, from me, a big thanks to all the ISMA board and all the people that volunteer uh, to work with us. Uh, thanks so much. We'll be posting uh, uh, this video on the, the website. So if you want to uh, you know, access it again, that should be up in, in about a week or so. We'll also put the a formal annual report on the website so you can have a look at that uh, if you wish to do so. Please, if you're not already a member of your local social marketing association, uh, please join. If there isn't one in your region, uh, think about setting one up in your region or your country. ISMA can uh, help you uh, with that. We have some guidance that we can share. 
Uh, if your focus of your work is global in nature and you want to join ISMA Direct, you do have that option as well, but we would recommend you join through a local association uh, if one exists. Uh, thanks so much, uh, everybody, for, for your time. I'm going to kind of close the meeting now. Uh, please do follow up with any uh, either Jackie or myself uh, after the meeting if there are issues that you want to pick up on. Uh, thanks so much and uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening or good morning uh, wherever you are. Thanks so much. <laughs>